So I'd like to welcome Steve Nesbitt, the president of the American Nuclear Society, uh, for a conversation on what is taking place in Ukraine. He has spent four decades in the nuclear power plant industry, starting back in 1982, performing safety analyses in support of nuclear power plants. Between 1996 and 2005, he led Duke Energy's uh, project with the U.S. Department of Energy to dispose of surplus plutonium from nuclear weapons. He also worked closely on policy issues of industry and government groups that included supporting the State Department on outreach to countries with developing nuclear power programs. And of course, he was the director of nuclear policy at Duke uh, for nearly a decade. But of course, is now at the American Nuclear Society, Stephen. We've all been watching the headlines out of Ukraine as they relate to active nuclear power plants, as well as the Chernobyl site. With some concern these last couple of weeks, I would love to start with your perspective on what you've been watching and how concerned you are about what you're seeing over there. Thanks, Moshe. I, I think uh, we're all horrified by what we're seeing. Um, I mean, it's a, a, an act of, uh, of unprovoked aggression and thousands of people have died as a result and a lot of destruction of infrastructure and facilities and things of that nature. And there doesn't seem to be a stop to it on the horizon. So I think, uh, you know, we, we feel the same way as, I, as you're seeing throughout America. Uh, with respect to the, the nuclear component, uh, we're concerned about uh, the potential impact of uh, warfare on nuclear operations there. But I think that some of the coverage is perhaps a little bit uh, overblown in terms of the potential for uh, widespread damage and things of that nature. Uh, but we're monitoring as closely as we can through uh, IAEA, through sources we have, such as the Ukrainian Nuclear Society and, and other groups. Yeah, some of the concerns come from Ukrainian government officials who are um, tweeting some of these things, but also from the fact that we're seeing the Russians engage in military activity, including shelling uh, on or near active nuclear power plants. Can you give us a bit of perspective of how protected plants like these are, um, given what's taking place around them? Sure. The nuclear power plants are robust structures. They're built of concrete and steel. And they're built to withstand extreme external hazards like earthquakes, like tornadoes, like high winds, like floods, things of this nature. So when you start talking about civilian infrastructure, you're not going to come across anything that's any tougher than a nuclear power plant. With that being said, of course, they weren't designed to withstand full scale warfare. Uh, we are, uh, we think that both Russia and Ukraine recognize that there's no percentage in, in damaging a nuclear plant. Uh, it's not in either one of their interests. Uh, we support the efforts of uh, Inter International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Grossi to uh, uh, meet with both sides in the conflict and try to put in place some, some guidelines and understanding so that uh, uh, the events that we observed when the uh, Russian forces occupied the Zaporizhia plant a few days ago uh, aren't repeated. Zaporizhia being the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. Um, and obviously, we saw some concerning headlines around that. Um, can you give us a sense of what sort of, you talked about the protections that nuclear power plants have in regards to natural disasters. Obviously, this is man-made warfare here. Um, what, what sorts of things are you looking for, or should uh, we as observers be looking for, in terms of what to be concerned about and what sorts of things should should we not be concerned about? Well, our, our primary concern is, 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 well, I'd say twofold. First is the equipment at the plant and second are the people who operate the plant. So with respect to the equipment, the reactor itself is inside a very thick and strong concrete and steel containment building uh, with, with walls that are several feet thick. So it's likely going to stand up to, to most things that get thrown at it. There are support equipment around the, uh, the containment building itself that are needed also for the plant. Uh, for example, there's been some coverage of uh, electrical power coming in and going out and things of that nature. And, and those are more vulnerable to direct attack. So um, ultimately, you know, we, we want the uh, 
both parties to understand that and to um, uh, basically lay off of the nuclear plant as they're uh, doing their thing in, in the Ukraine. It's, it's really uh, the, the first thing that needs to happen uh, is for the, the Russian invaders to, uh, to back off and leave. Um, I mentioned the, the people in the plant itself. Um, the, there's a plant operating staff that, that, that uh, maintain the plant and operate it. And, uh, and, you know, it's very trying circumstances, obviously, when there's bullets flying around. And it's very important that the plant operators are given the opportunity to rest, that they're not concerned about the welfare of their families and things of that nature. So um, we are, again, supporting uh, IAEA and its efforts to try to put in place the proper measures to ensure that there's not any unfortunate damage that occurs. And as far as operating a nuclear power plant for the for the layman out there, uh, like myself and, and like most folks, um, are we, you know, as we talk about active warfare happening at the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, are we one button away from disaster? You know, give us a sense of security safety protocols that exist because we really only know what we've seen in, in t TV and film, Steve. Right, right. So um, one of the things that you know, you're getting coverage of, of sort of the operating nuclear power plants and you're also hearing about Chernobyl uh, because there was incidents that occurred at Chernobyl when the, apparently when the Russian military invaded, they picked the shortest distance between two lines and that went through Chernobyl. And so they stirred up contamination that was still there from the, uh, from the accident that occurred in 1986. So one point that I want to make, two points I want to make. First of all, the Chernobyl plant is a very different situation. It's really not a nuclear power plant. It's a it's a decommissioning facility, and there's there's been no power generated from nuclear power there since 2000. And the fuel that exists on the site from the the, the four Chernobyl units, uh, including the one that, that that had the accident, is all very uh, what we call old and cold. There's not a lot of decay heat coming off of it. It's all in storage mode. And even if there was a complete interruption of electric power, you would not see uh, elevated temperatures in the fuel that would lead to massive releases of radioactivity. So I think- For, oh, wait, of, I, I, Sorry, I just wanna pause you there. For how long? Because we've seen these reports that power is being cut, power is back on, power is being cut, power is back on, as far as Chernobyl is concerned. How long would power be cut where you would start to become concerned? Uh, there's no, it, it's, it's safe forever. I mean, the, the, the fuel is in, some of the fuel is in dry storage containers on the site, and these are passively cooled devices. So just the air naturally heated by the, the canisters removes enough energy to keep the fuel temperatures um, within bounds. We have these dry storage containers all over the United States in, at nuclear power plant sites. And then some of the fuel is in a pool storage. It's being transferred to dry storage for the longer uh, term duration of the storage. But the, the fuel that's in the pool is so cool that even if all the water was to evaporate out of the pool, which would take a very, very long time, just the air and the fuel pool would be enough to keep the temperatures uh, from getting up too high. So basically, you, good. Wait, when you say very, very long, are we talking weeks, months, years? What Forever. What Forever. Okay. It, it's yeah. It can be air cooled forever in the pool, based on the analyses that were done in 2011, and it's the full the the fuel is even cooler now than it was back then. So I, I think that I, I really want to you know make people understand that the 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 radioactive material at Chernobyl really doesn't pose a threat just because the electricity supply might be interrupted. I'll also note that they have on-site diesel generators, which I understand is running when the, when the power is off. There's been some success in restoring power to the site, and then I understand it went back off again and they're trying to repair it again. You know, we don't really have boots on the ground there uh, so we, I can't give you any better intelligence on that than what we're hearing from the media. But, but all I'm saying is that the worst case scenario from a loss of power at Chernobyl is still not bad. Um, 
So then, you, you know, that, that's the Chernobyl situation. As far as the other plants are concerned, they're a very different design from the Chernobyl plant. And I just want to reassure people that the kind of accident that occurred at Chernobyl in 1986 cannot occur at one of these nuclear power plants that Ukraine is operating today. They are large light water reactors with, as I said, very robust containment vessels. And the power excursion that happened at Chernobyl is just physically not possible at the, at the, uh, um, at the other reactors. So there, uh, I'd also note that uh, since the Fukushima event in Japan in 2011, the Ukrainian reactors have been upgraded. So they have more diverse means of cooling in the event of an extended loss of power to the facility. So there's really a lot of uh, defense in depth um, levels of protection in place at the plants. So um, it's not like a situation. Let me, let, me put it, let me put it this way very succinctly. If I was in Ukraine right now, I would not be worried about the nuclear power plants. I would be worried about Russian bullets, bombs, and missiles. Makes sense. Um, because I, one of the headlines that keeps popping is power cut, power on, power cut. I want to just focus on Chernobyl for a second and we'll go back to the active plants. And then the regulator, the Ukrainian regulator informed the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, yesterday or Sunday that the staff of the Chernobyl plant are no longer performing repair and maintenance due to fatigue, including uh, their safety related uh, equipment maintenance. That seemed like a concerning headline. Uh, how do you read that headline? Well, it's, it's very concerning from the standpoint of the, the plant workers, and they've been under incredible duress uh, over these weeks now. Uh, we understand they haven't been allowed to leave. So, you know, you're not getting the normal shift turnover and things of that nature. But the, the point that I want to make to and, and make sure people understand is that Chernobyl is a decommissioning facility. So really what they're doing is they're, they're tearing down structures, they're decontaminating, things of that nature. It's not like the operators are needed to do particular things in order to protect the, uh, the radioactive material. With that being said, you know, ideally you would want the fuel pool that some of the used fuel is stored in to be in its normal cooling mode with um, circulating water and heat exchangers and that kind of stuff. And these are the kind of things that they're referring to when they talk about the safety related activities. But like I said before, it's not a desirable situation, but in the worst case situation in which electricity would be lost for uh, you know extended period of time and the water in the pool would evaporate off and things like this. And we're talking you know weeks or months for that to happen. Even then you're not gonna get some kind of temperature excursion that leads to fuel damage. And, and what we saw in 1986, this idea of major radiation being released into the air and threatening uh, a lar the larger environment, you don't, you don't fear that in this scenario? I do not. Um, and then just, I'd love for your explanation, how do you explain this to your you know, family, friends, et cetera? Nuclear fuel rods that are cooling, what, what exactly are they? And, and what is this process that you're describing, this cooling process? Sure, so nuclear fuel rods are pellets of uranium oxide, and of course, it's the uranium that splits or fissions that leads to the release of electric of, of uh, heat energy that ultimately the plant will convert into electricity. So these fuel pellets are uh, contained inside welded metal rods, um, welded shut zirconium alloy rods. And so the rods contain the radioactive fission products that are generated by the fission process. And you take these rods and you bundle a bunch of them together um, and that becomes what we call a fuel assembly. And then you take a number of fuel assemblies and put them in uh, a, a configuration in the reactor vessel and that's what we call the core. So the plant is designed so that you have cooling water that flows around these fuel rods and the fuel assemblies and removes the, the heat that's generated. They take that hot water, they run it through a steam generator, in this case, um, multiple steam generators. And so on the other side of the tubes in the steam generator, you've got steam being produced 
produced, the steam goes through a turbine and then spins the turbine and produces electricity. And then when the plants shut down, rather than running the water through the steam generators, because you're not making steam anymore, you have uh, what we call decay heat removal cooling loops that circulate water through the reactor vessel. And at that point, when the plant shut down, it's producing much, much less energy, much less heat than it is when it's operating because the chain reaction is shut down. However, there's still decay heat in the core that needs to be removed. And that's what the decay heat removal systems uh, are designed to do. So basically, a nuclear power plant never gets completely shut down. There's a, a, a process that lasts for, what, years, decades, centuries, perhaps? The, the, yeah, the fuel is always uh, producing some heat. But um, once, you, once you've been shut down for um, a while, it's, it's a relatively small amount of heat. But you still need to uh, take provisions to, to uh, make sure that the fuel gets cooled. And Chernobyl, uh, we're coming up on the 32nd anniversary of the um, disaster uh, in April. Uh, that took place in 1986. How long will Chernobyl continue to need upkeep and maintenance uh, to prevent a future disaster there? Well, uh, the, the uh, international community completed relatively recently a, a project to put a, a, a containment dome over the damaged reactor building, which is uh, intended to keep the, um, the, the radioactive material from spreading. Uh, and again, that's that's something that doesn't require maintenance and upkeep or cooling or anything like that. Uh, as far as the uh, um, the surrounding area, I don't really I'm not really in a position to tell you when the uh, radioactivity will decay off enough so that you can uh, start using that that area around the plant again. But um, uh, it's it's pretty much uh, at this point, like I said, it's 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 not so dangerous that you can't march Russian military units through it on their way to Kiev, right? Yeah. And, and, just, and just to reiterate, it's not currently, there is a vessel, there is a uh, dome over the, that reactor. It's not currently leaking radiation into the environment right now. No, it's not. And there's a, there's a lot of radiation detectors um, you know, around uh, Chernobyl. Uh, in fact, it was when, the, uh, when the, they started to increase their readings a little bit as the Russian army mar marched through, which is why people uh, were, were concerned about it. But the, the re as I understand it, the readings went up briefly and then they came back down. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's well instrumented. And uh, again, uh, it, Chernobyl does, is not anything that, that in my mind poses an immediate threat to the uh, to the people in Ukraine or for that matter in other countries around there. And 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 what you just said in terms of the radiation readings going up, we saw those headlines and you know people get that on their phone and they're like radiation going up and what what exactly did that mean? Then I saw headlines that it you know was dust being kicked up. Should we be concerned about that dust and 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 what were we talking about when we talk about radiation levels going up? Right. So the levels we were talking about were on the order of um, uh, the kind of radiation you would get in a day, for example, the amount of radiation you would get from taking a cross-country airplane flight. So, you know, people may or may not be aware, but uh, when you fly in an airplane because you're high in altitude and you don't have as much air between you and the sun and the, the universe, you get more cosmic radiation uh, from outer space. And so people who fly uh, across country, they pick up a, a small amount more radiation than they would otherwise. That's about the amount of radiation that you'd be getting uh, at, the, uh, at the Chernobyl facility when they had those elevated readings, which I understand have gone away now. But if you're not within the immediate vicinity of the Chernobyl facility, when you read radiation levels up and you are in Eastern Europe or Western Europe or, <laughs> yeah. say, the U.S. Good point. It, it's a localized effect. It's not anything that's that's spreading through the, you know, to, to nearby countries or anything. It's just in that in that immediate vicinity. Got it. All right. I appreciate I appreciate all this insight into Chernobyl. We see Chernobyl. Obviously, some of us watch the HBO film. Um, a couple years ago and so we see that we see it, it it leads to a lot of concern i think at the same time we hear the president of russia discussing his nuclear arms and so there's just a lot of nuclear talk that i think is raising people's 
anxiety levels right now. That's true. That's true. Um, you know, certainly those of us in the nuclear technology field, we like to talk about the benefits of nuclear energy. You know, it's a it's a really great clean energy source, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. It's available 24 hours a day around the clock. So, you know, it's not something that you can't depend on when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing. So that's the stuff that we like to talk about. And yeah. obviously the uh, all of the uh, the connections uh, with the war and, and nuclear weapons and things like that, it's naturally going to come to people's mind, completely understand it, but uh, not, not what we like to focus on. And I, I want to get to that at the end, especially as we talk about energy right now, but I just want to close out a couple questions more on, on the Ukraine situation. And was curious because I was reading up on um, what benefits Russia may get from having control of the Ukrainian nuclear power plants, including the disposal of spent fuel. From your perspective, what what benefits do the Russians have by taking control of these nuclear power plants? Well, I mean, nuclear power plants are uh, revenue generators. Operating plants are they they make a very useful product, electricity that sells on the market. So you know, if you could take advantage of that and put the money in your pocket, I guess that's a that's a good thing. But let me tell you, the amount of money you're going to make from one of these plants doesn't come close to paying for the all of the death and destruction and and that the Russians have experienced themselves as a result of their invasion. I mean, I think they they bit off a lot more than they they could chew. And uh, they're going to pay the price for that in terms of sanctions, in terms of immediate deaths and fatalities and things of that nature. So I, I I think if if they were if they were invading Ukraine because they wanted to uh, take advantage of their nuclear power plants, they made a huge miscalculation. And then when it comes to safety of those active plants, um, and you know there's explosions happening around. We've seen the video allegedly from inside the facility where they were telling the Russian soldiers, "Please don't shoot at an active nuclear facility." Um, is it can it be as simple as turning off? The facility for safety. Uh, what sort of precautions can um, you know? Because I understand that Ukraine has 15 operational reactors around the country. What sort of safety mechanisms are in place um, if, God forbid, we start to see another situation like this around one of the power plants? Yeah. Well, the the reactors will shut down. Either the uh, the staff will shut them down, or they will automatically shut down if there's equipment damage to the normal plant systems that are involved in the uh, uh, the generation of electricity. Um, so at that point, then the the decay heat load in the plant drops drastically and the need for cooling water drops down. So um, at that, but there is still a need to keep uh, keep power to the plants and keep water circulating and things of that nature. And and so there by turning off, I guess turning off the power plant, you are turning off power then to the parts of the country or I guess the region that you're supplying power to, but that ensures no uh, major or I guess prevents uh, the likelihood of a major incident? Yeah, it certainly reduces dramatically that that probability. Um, I mean, the Ukrainians are, are kind of between a rock and a hard place. They have uh, they have a lot of uh, their, their electricity is generated by nuclear power and they need that electricity. So, uh, you know, in my view, the uh, international community should recognize the special nature of nuclear facilities along the lines that Director General Grossi is 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 advocating and, and just stay away from them uh, during a war. But you know, by definition, in a war, you can't uh, you can't control what people are going to do. Got it. Um, prior to the war, what was the safety reputation of the Ukrainian nuclear power plant industry? Yeah, the Ukrainian plants were all, uh, you know, in good standing with the World Association of Nuclear Operators and the International Atomic Energy Agency. They've been running these plants for a long time. They have trained professional staffs, and uh, and they've they've made the necessary upgrades after Fukushima and things of that nature. So you know we don't have any issues or concerns there. Got it. And you were mentioning that the plants today are much different than the Chernobyl plant of 32 years ago, even Fukushima of 10 years ago. Um, what, what's changed? Why why should we feel better about these plants than the plants that existed decades ago? Well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is 
again, you're not going to get, because of the nature of the, the plant, the Chernobyl plant was a graphite moderated water cooled reactor. I know that doesn't necessarily mean a lot to people, but it's very different from the light water reactors that are operating in the rest of the country. And it couldn't undergo this rapid power excursion, uh, which disrupted and blew the reactor core apart at Chernobyl. So that's difference number one. Difference number two is perhaps even more important, and that's that the Chernobyl plant had no containment vessel around it. I talked about the, the thick, robust uh, containment structure around the, uh, the light water reactors like the Zaporizhia plants. You know, that didn't exist at Chernobyl because of the design of the reactor. And uh, as a result, when the core blew apart Part at Chernobyl, it also spread the radionuclides uh, out, and then there was a fire that resulted, and the fire also contributed to the, the spreading of the radionuclides. So none of that is, is applicable to, the, uh, to the, the light water reactor plants that the Ukrainians operate in the rest of the country. The, the strong containment vessel should minimize any off-site radioactive releases, even in the event of a worst-case accident. Yeah, and 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 I, I'm going to go dark before we go light again. So the worst case, you know, the the the, the Russians are using all these missiles. They're shelling cities, etc. You know, they they have some pretty powerful weaponry. Is that weaponry powerful enough to to um, strike one of these reactors and, and cause some sort of incident there? Or again, are there safety precautions in place even if a missile was to hit? The reactor. Because the containment structures are so robust, the biggest concern that I have is not the the so the direct hit per se, as it is that uh, some of the uh, the key safety equipment that resides outside the containment structure could be damaged, and uh, that could interrupt the cooling to the to the reactors. Uh, you know, now there's a lot of water inside there, so it, it, it's a, it takes a while for things to progress. But in the worst case scenario, you could see the fuel heat up to the point where there could be some fuel damage and release of radionuclides inside the containment structure. Um, but the beauty of the, having the containment structure there is that it should contain most of the radioactivity there rather than having it blow all over the uh, surrounding area. Got it. So it would take quite an irresponsible like fiasco by the, the Russians to, to it's something we haven't seen thus far, even That's what correct. we saw last week in, in, in at the previous plan. That's yeah. correct. Um, and so as we talk about, uh, as we're you know talking today, the price of oil is at record highs. There's a lot of talk of gas. Um, where is the state of the conversation these days when it comes to nuclear power um, domestically and internationally as an alternative? Right, so I'll speak to domestically first. Um, there's a whole lot of interest in uh, nuclear energy as part of our clean energy future. Um, so part of that, a testimony to that is the nuclear power plants that we operate in the country today, there's 93 of them. They produce 20% uh, of the country's electricity and more than half of the uh, emissions free electricity. Um, th those plants, uh, even though they're getting a little long in the tooth, uh, uh, are the operators are uh, applying for and receiving licenses to operate them for an additional 20 years because they're such a, a valuable asset. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in new reactor designs, advanced reactors of a, actually uh, very different designs from the, the current generation. Uh, some of those use different coolants, uh, like gas coolant, uh, molten salt, uh, um, liquid metal even. And uh, these reactors incorporate a couple of things that make people interested in them. One is uh, they have a lot of inherent safety features, what we call hands-off safety. So you're not relying so much on pumps and valves and things like that. You just kind of, the, the, the natural cooling features of the plant will ensure that the fuel doesn't get too hot, even in the event of one of the accidents like we're talking about today. And the other thing is they can generate electricity any, or generate um, heat at, at an even higher temperature. And that higher temperature allows them to, um, to take on some roles like for industrial process heating and uh, desalination and hydrogen generation and things of that nature to go beyond the, the just the basic electricity production mode. Um, the advanced nuclear plants should 
work well with uh, renewable energy because they can they can generate uh, um, uh, energy while the um, while the renewable is not available and maybe when the renewable energy is available the nuclear plants can 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 uh, generate uh, electricity or generate energy that's stored for later use so um, the, what we've seen in the U.S. is that there's a lot of organizations, uh, environmental organizations, that are very uh, interested in expanding the use of, of clean nuclear energy. And uh, there's a couple of projects underway right now to get a couple of these advanced reactor designs built and, uh, and operating in the U.S. Uh, I would say that worldwide, the, the outlook is similar. The, the outlook varies depending on where you are in the world. Um, you know, Germans are very vehemently anti-nuclear, and I don't know that they're going to do anything about that. But other parts of the of the world, China, for example, India, are are very uh, very bullish on expanding their nuclear energy. I saw the plant that opened in Tennessee several years ago. Are there other major ones under construction? Is is that the newest one that we have? Yeah, there's two plants in Georgia that are under construction. That's the Vogel three and four units. Hopefully Vogel three will start up uh, this this year. And uh, those are the, the two that are in the pipeline right now. But the, as I said, there's some uh, uh, private uh, public partnerships underway to get some more of these new reactor designs in, in place and operating before the end of the decade. And, and when we are having the climate change discussion, where does nuclear energy fall on that? Because um, there's also been a debate for many years of what to do with the spent fuel rods, where the, you know, the, the whole situation we've had in Nevada for many years. Yeah, so um, the, the good news is that the, uh, the used fuel from nuclear plants has been managed safely and securely for decades. Uh, and the technology for doing that, I kind of described it earlier, but dry storage technology is good for, you know, decades or, or hundreds of years even. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, certainly we would like to see the government fulfill its responsibility to uh, establish a permanent repository for disposing of the radioactive material that can't be reused, which is their, their obligation under law, but something they haven't been successful at. We look overseas and other countries are making uh, good progress in that regard. Finland actually has a geologic repository under construction. Sweden's not too far behind. So um, it's, it's not something that's gonna get solved in the immediate future, but we're optimistic that um, we'll get there here in the US. Uh, and certainly there's, there's plenty of time to, uh, to, to uh, uh, get to that point. Got it. And uh, I'll end with this. What do most Americans not know about nuclear power and nuclear energy that uh, you think it's really important for folks to know? Well, I think that uh, most people would be surprised to find out that uh, that nuclear power is what produces most of our clean electricity in the country today. I know that for a fact because my local utility actually runs 11 nuclear power plants. And all I see on TV is advertisements for the solar farms are putting in and things like that, which is all well and good. But you know the reality is that the solar energy is doing very little, and the nuclear energy is doing a lot when it comes to displacing harmful greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we have a bright future for nuclear generation here in the United States and worldwide as, as well. Steve Nesbitt, thank you very much for an enlightening conversation and, and hopefully uh, helping to bring some folks' blood pressures down as we watch the headlines come out of Ukraine. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.